Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After a weekend of waiting, we finally have tens of thousands of images dumped from the Perseverance rover, showing one of the most exciting parts of the mission. Certainly the most exciting part of the mission if you were one of the people working to put the spacecraft on the surface of Mars. There had actually been quite a few complaints about how the image pipeline hadn't been turned on right away, just as it had been with uh, Mars Exploration Rovers and Curiosity. But I think really what was happening was when Curiosity landed, the descent video was constructed by people on the internet before the big press conference. And I think they were holding that data back so that they could wow the public with it. So the good news is that most of the cameras worked, only one failed, but the bad news is the microphone failed on descent. And so once again, the curse of microphones on Mars lives to fight for another landing. And we take a quick look at this image from the high rise camera on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter because you're gonna be seeing these craters from above. But of course, the first thing we see is the parachute deployment. They only show us one camera, but this camera was actually operating at 75 frames per second just for the deployment. Remember, this vehicle is moving at supersonic speed, so there's a lot of force that goes through that deployment. You see how fast it happened. But there's something extra moving in that frame. There's this dome-shaped object here. I think that is an antenna dome, like it's a transparent piece of material that uh, allows the radio to be transmitted back. That wasn't supposed to come off, but it was knocked off by the force of the mortar that shoots out this parachute. This parachute is packed down and it is really solid. It's like as dense as a block of wood. But once it gets out and starts deploying, it picks up that you know, gas pressure very quickly and of course deploys rapidly. Now, the other thing that was mentioned during the press conference was that there is a secret message encoded in this parachute. For engineers studying the parachute deployment, these patterns help them figure out the geometry of the, uh, the parachute as it's deployed. But hey, they, they encoded a message in there, rather like how they encoded the Morse code for JPL into the wheel tracks of the Curiosity rover. I'll say it's a pretty simple code, but I'll explain it after I show the rest of the video, just in case you guys wanna try to figure it out yourself. So the next step is heat shield deployment. And again, you know, we see a lot of cool stuff happening here as it falls away. Of course, the main vehicle is being slowed down by the parachute, but the heat shield is not. If you look down at the four o'clock position, you can see one of the springs bouncing around inside. There are nine of these springs around the edge of the heat shield to push it away when it separates. But after separation, this one has clearly been knocked off and it's just kind of rolling around in there as the heat shield falls towards Mars. So now at this point, the vehicle is falling. It's being decelerated by the parachute, but it's still moving hundreds of miles per hour. The heat shield begins to fall out of sight. Unlike Curiosity, we can't follow the heat shield all the way down to impact. It moves out of frame before that happens. But uh, in a moment, on the top left, you get to see near where the landing site is. Remember I pointed out the two craters and the, you know, well, the S-shaped ridge there? So I'm just gonna highlight the landing site roughly so you can then follow this on the way down. In fact, let's just use this wider set of images from orbiters so you can get an idea of the context of where things are. This is a river delta that flowed into the crater. So now you've got your bearings. The spacecraft is of course getting its bearings. It's taking photographs using the uh, navigation camera for the terrain relative navigation, looking for things that match its map. So the map has already been prepared. It's looking for safe spots that it can put down. This image matching logic is performed by an FPGA, which is offloading a lot of the heavy lifting from the core computer. The core is a very slow computer, but uh, yeah, it figures out where it's gonna land and apparently it gets there within about five meters of the target. So it does all this navigation checking and testing while it's under the parachute, but they're continuing to head downwards towards the surface at hundreds of miles per hour, and so they have to separate out the lander using rocket power. And you'll see a flash of light as the pyros fire, and it is now free flying under rockets. And the first thing it does is it diverts towards the landing site to get out of the way of anything that might fall. So it banks over, you see, and we as it banked over, you could see the dunes there, and it's now traversing, 
and it's going to then bank in the opposite direction to null out its horizontal velocity. At this point, it's getting very close to the surface and we are starting to see details we could not see from orbit. At this point, it's flying on eight of the hydrazine monopropellant thrusters. And as we get in close, you'll start to see dust blowing around. And that means we're close enough to start deploying the sky crane. So now we have three different cameras in this display. We get to see both vehicles looking at each other, watching the operation as it lowers the spacecraft to the surface. So it's great to see this from all three angles with the, the three different cameras. So once the rover is safely put on the surface, they call Dango, Tango Delta, they detach the cables, and then the, the sky crane is commanded to fly away and dispose of itself a safe distance away. And that was better than any touchdown in the Super Bowl. So now let's look at a few things in more detail. First of all, uh, during the divert maneuver, it's you know, pitched over you know, 60 degrees or so making the divert. And as it's doing that, it's falling downward. So if you ping pong the video looking sideways, you can actually see some 3D depth in these cliffs here. So during the sky crane, we get to see a whole bunch of weird stuff we didn't quite expect. First of all, those engines, they look awfully dark. It's almost as if they're not uh, working. Now, obviously they're working. We can see the uh, exhaust you know, pushing the surface of Mars around. These are hydrazine monopropellant thrusters. Hydrazine is a molecule with two nitrogens and then four hydrogens around the outside. And they drive that through a catalyst that causes it to decompose mainly into nitrogen and hydrogen and possibly a bit of ammonia. This is an exothermic reaction that produces temperatures of about 1000 Celsius, but by the time it expands through that nozzle, it's cooled down and recombined. There's no more active uh, components. So it's just optically thin and it's not really producing any visible flame. Unlike the CGI that NASA produced to try and show us what they thought it would look like. I mean, if you fire these engines on Earth at sea level, you might see a bit more of a flame because you've got more pressure to keep the uh, gas confined and there's hydrogen in it and hydrogen burns. But you know, on Earth we see jets performing vertical takeoffs using just jet power. We don't see any fiery afterburner effects here because frankly, what matters is the amount of thrust, not the amount of fire and flame and spectacle. The reaction inside the combustion chamber is still very hot, like it's a thousand degrees, and the combustion chamber is getting hot. If you look uh, on the top engine here, the combustion chamber just inside that cowling is glowing red. You'll also notice the one below it doesn't seem to be glowing as much because I think once they get this close to the surface, that engine is turned off. The one above it is canted outwards slightly more. So when they can fly, when they're close to hovering, they only need the four engines and they use the ones which are pointed further out so that that reduces the amount of impact on the ground. In fact, you can see that transition du during the landing video. If you watch as they come down, it produces a horizontal line across the middle where there's this stagnation point where the two plumes are interacting. And then as they switch off some of the thrusters, that region becomes less well-defined. And of course, then we start to drop the rover down. I think it's actually a little easier to see when it's not in slow motion. You can see, yeah, the big transition happens very obviously. Now, people will be watching these videos, of course, to try to see how the ground is interacting with the uh, plumes. So I made a video where I held the framing constant and that means that everything stays in roughly the same place. So it's much easier to see, you know, little pieces of rock getting exposed as the, the dust blows off them and how the shape of some of the piles of, uh, you know, dust changes very quickly as the, uh, as the engines come down and disturb them. I'm sure someone will write actual scientific papers on this. Meanwhile, we will just, you know, look slack jawed at the, the dropship, basically. I mean, this really reminds me of the dropship in Aliens. Look at those clouds. This is the very fine dust on Mars being blown into the air. And this very fine dust produces this blue scattering effect, very similar to a blue sky on Earth, but slightly different physics. And then it gets commanded to leave. This doesn't really have any onboard navigation or guidance compared to the main vehicle. It basically gets a final command to cut the cables and go off and burn its engine for a few seconds. That's it. It doesn't have any other control. It does have a computer on board, by the way, 
that is sending the t- the image signal down, that spiral data cable there, that is Ethernet, right? They've got two computers in this spacecraft networked by Ethernet to give us the image signals from the uh, dropship. While I mention it, this there is a second parachute camera they got data from. It's connected directly to the computer in the rover via USB 3. So this makes it the first Linux, the first USB 3 on Mars. And this parachute shot brings us back to the puzzle that I talked about earlier. What code is hidden in here? There are four concentric rings here consisting of patterns of orange and white sections. The orange sections represent binary one, the the white sections represent binary zero. So if we look at the innermost ring, we see a large part of it is red and that is not uh, containing data, but you can split it into these pie slices and now you have bit patterns. So if the least significant bit is at the clockwise edge and we convert these to binary, we get 41185 or 51814, depending upon which way you read it. But being humans good at pattern matching, we think maybe we can transcribe these to letters and the direction becomes obvious. Maybe JPL are a fan of 1980s synth pop and want to reference the Human League. After all, Mars missions are the things that dreams are made of. But no, of course, this is just one part of a larger message which has been fully decoded, Dare Mighty Things, one of the mottos of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The outer ring contains the longitude and latitude of the laboratory. Obviously, the numbers in this case are just numbers. And we know the image pipeline is running. We're also getting the individual frames. So we might conceivably improve on the quality, although the cover bal- color balance is all over the place. Uh, but of course, we still have the sounds to listen to. Now, what that is, is the sounds of the rover, which has you know, active thermal control systems, probably pumping stuff around. But uh, also what you heard was the wind bumping into the microphone. And honestly, that's something you typically try to control. But in this case, we're happy to hear anything. Now, we don't know how long that microphone will last, but I'm hoping that it gets to hear some of the activities. In particular, I really want to hear the rover just rolling across the surface and crunching gravel underneath its wheels. I want to hear ingenuity flying. I want to hear robot arm drilling things. We don't know what we're going to get on this mission. It's got a long life ahead of it, hopefully. While these engineering camera views are really exciting for us space nerds, the real science will start to soon. I'm Scott Manley. Thanks for flying us, Sky Crane. Fly to victory.